Good morning, this is Dave Sylvester, Calvary Chapel in York, England. It's a beautiful sunrise this morning. Um, I just thought I would share this morning some thoughts the Lord <clears throat> put on my heart this morning. He got me up at a little before two and I went downstairs fully intending to just pray a bit and go back to sleep. But then he kept bringing the thought back to my mind and I wanted to share it with you this morning while it was fresh in my heart. We're looking at Matthew chapter nine. And so if you have your Bible, let's do a nice morning Bible study. It's a beautiful morning. Um, <clears throat> we left off last week, obviously in chapter eight and where we left off was Jesus uh, had healed the demoniacs. At least one of them we know was healed in the other gospel accounts. It mentions just one. Uh, Matthew mentions two. But we're told that he healed them. And these are men that were demon-possessed men that were terrorizing the town of Gadara. Gadara there in the tombs, screeching and just out of their mind. Jesus shows up. And he heals them, and it says that, at least for one of them, he was clothed and in his right mind. And that's Jesus. That's what he does for all of us. Because all of us need to be clothed in our right mind. So Jesus <clears throat> heals and casts out the demons into the herd of swine. And they end up going over to the cliff, as you know, and drowned. And so the people told Jesus to depart from them and so Jesus got into a boat and went across from Gadara the five mile journey across the northern end of the lake past Bethsaida over to Capernaum which was Jesus's hometown a ministry hometown that's where he based his ministry there in the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee and so they're heading over to Capernaum and that's where we pick up in Matthew chapter 9 verse 1 So we'll look at that. And maybe uh, <clears throat> I'll have to find a place to put my phone so I can read along with you. But I tell you, it's so beautiful just walking along this morning. The sun coming up. Matthew chapter 9. Maybe I can find just a nice tree to sit underneath. I'll have to contend with the dog walkers and people that come out through this field. It's so beautiful. Okay, there we go. I needed to turn the phone around. <clears throat> this is really my, kind of my loop for praying. It's a great place to come. To just pray it's that hill back there again it's a high place here in york and it's, it's just a great place to go pray and so we're on the loop here this morning uh, to study chapter nine now what's happening in chapter nine is jesus gets into the boat in gadara to go to the other side and it's about a five mile journey and so he gets in a boat uh, one of they say that there were anywhere upwards of 300 boats on the sea of galilee at any given time and so we he gets in one of the boats, goes over to Capernaum, passes by Bethsaida on the right-hand side, and then lands in Capernaum. And they <clears throat> tells us that these, uh, these guys that had some faith bring this paralytic to Jesus. And it says that he noticed that they had faith. Now they bring the paralytic to Jesus, but they find that they can't get to Jesus because it's so crowded in the house, obviously. When Jesus is in the house, everybody wants to be there. And so they couldn't get into the house. Now, if, you're, if you've ever, excuse me, if you've ever been to Capernaum, uh, it's, you have the ruins there of Capernaum, but they actually have this, the synagogue that's been built on the original footers of the, of the synagogue, the basalt rock. And when you get there, you can see the basalt rock, the dark the black rock, and then the new kind of white stone that's been built on top. But you get a great idea of the synagogue. And you also overlook the uh, uh, foundations, the footers of the other houses that were there. So it's easy to picture 
uh, the scene taking place close to the synagogue, close to what's believed to be Peter's house, and then the Sea of Galilee. And so what they do, they bring this guy to, to Jesus. <clears throat> and we aren't told this in this account in Matthew, but we are told it in the other Gospels that they took the paralytic and they lowered him through some tiles that they'd ripped open off the top of the roof to get the paralytic to Jesus. They just lowered him in front of Jesus. So I, I like friends like that. We need friends that are willing to go the extra mile to bring us to Jesus. Man, what have we done lately to bring people to Jesus? Are you willing, willing to go take the roof off of somebody's house to get them to Jesus? You know, these guys were desperate. And so they lower this paralytic in front of Jesus. And in this account in Matthew, we pick up and it says that there's a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you now that is a that's an amazing statement so they and we'll get to that in a minute so jesus sees their faith and he um, is going and he's going to heal this man but the first thing jesus says is son your sins are forgiven you now <clears throat> the pharisees when they saw that they they were outraged they said this is blasphemy and it would have been blasphemy if Jesus wasn't God. If it would have been just any man, it would have been blasphemy. And so they were right in saying that this is blasphemy. Sorry, my pages are flying all over the place here. Um, <clears throat> there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is just me holding the camera, walking through uh, the woods in this little loop by my house. And so... Jesus says your sins are forgiven. And man, they just, they could, who is this guy coming to town? Now, he's saying your sins are forgiven, but anybody can say your sins are forgiven. How do you know your sins are forgiven? And so <clears throat> they said this is blasphemous. But what Jesus is going to do is going to show them that he's not just any old man. This is the one who has the ability and the power to forgive sins. Now we looked at the authority of Jesus in chapter 8 and also in the Sermon on the Mount he had the authority to teach, the authority to, over the demonic realm, he had authority you know, over the elements as, he's calmed, as he calmed the winds and the waves. Jesus has authority and now we see he has the, the authority to forgive sins. And the people just, you know, these scribes said that's blasphemy. But again, it would have been if he was if he wasn't God. But Jesus says to them I think this is a key too thing for our ministry. As he said, so to prove to you, he said, is it harder to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? Now, in one sense, it's easier to say stand up and walk because that's just to speak to, that just means he just needed to speak the word. But to say your sins are forgiven, Jesus had to die for that. He had to die so that we could receive his forgiveness. And so Jesus says, what's, what's harder? But he says, so that you know that the Son of Man, which is an expression he used of himself, the Son of Man, to show you that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, he said to the man, sorry, I'm a little bit lost in here, rise up and walk. And so basically Jesus is saying, I have the power to forgive sin, and I'll show you how I have power to forgive sin. He says, rise up and walk. And then guy jumps up and he goes, take your bed and go home. And so the guy rises up and he walks. Amazing. Everyone would have been just completely dumbfounded. And so I love it. So anyway, let me go over here. Maybe I can find a place I can sit down. So Jesus says to this guy, be of good, good cheer. So I'll go back to the the beginning part of the story. You know, this man, we're told by tradition that, that his condition was because of a sinful lifestyle. And so he needed, he needed to be set free. He needed deliverance. He needed to be of good cheer. And these friends of his brought him to Jesus. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And that's the most important thing for anyone above healing 
above anything, to have our sins forgiven. That's what gives us good cheer. And so I, I, love, I love what Jesus does to, to people's lives. Be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And so I want you to just set this phone here. Maybe, maybe, let's see. Hi. <laughs> let's see if this is going to work. I just want to plop down here in this little field. And we can have our Bible study. Ah, here we go. So, so he says, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once the scribes, some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. But Jesus, it says, knowing their thoughts in verse four. Now I can read that. I have my, my, uh, my Bible open here. Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or say, arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go home. And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. And so you have Jesus healing this paralytic. You have Jesus doing his ministry. And God is glorified in that. Now, something that the Lord spoke to me this morning concerning the forgiveness of sins. I woke up thinking about that verse in John where the disciples after Jesus had uh, been in the tomb and then he rose again but they were actually in a house before he appeared to them when he appeared to them maybe the second time or whenever it was second or third time he appeared to them when they were hiding out in the house and so it's just he appears to them and he says peace be unto you and so and he, he, and he goes on to say, um, matter of fact, I think we'll, we'll read it. Let's go over to John chapter 20. 20, 21. So Jesus said to them, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of of any they are retained and that's the thing that the lord got me up thinking about it i was um <clears throat> thinking about the fact that jesus forgave this man's sin now only jesus has the ability to forgive sins and yet sorry and yet he gives uh this commission to the to the disciples when they're in the room hiding out and he says as he breathes on them first of all and says uh, receive you the Holy Spirit. And then he says to them, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And then he makes a statement about, in the King James, this, the, whosoever sins are remitted, they are remitted. Whoever sins are retained, they are retained. Um, in the New King James, it says, uh, if you forgive any sins, forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, man, this is powerful. And it's one of those verses that we can just read it. But I feel like the significance of it really ties in with Matthew chapter 9 here in the healing of the paralytic and the statement that the, the scribes made to Jesus. You know, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Now, for us, the Lord commissions us. He, he tells us, as the Father sent me into the world, so send I you. And so here we see Jesus's ministry of forgiving this person's sins. Now, is he saying when he tells us that whoever sends you forgive, they're forgiven, and whoever sends you retain, they're retained. Is he saying that we have the ability to forgive people of their sins, you know, to tell somebody your sins are forgiven or your sins are not forgiven? I don't think we have the power to forgive sins, but we have power to proclaim the one who does forgive sin and the one who does also cause people to retain their sins. In other words, he has told us to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel and to tell people that their sins can be forgiven. And people need to know that. We're going to see that in a minute with Matthew. They need to know that their sins can be forgiven. What is the biggest weight on anyone? It's their sin. And so Jesus tells the disciples as he's commissioning them 
to carry on his ministry. He breathes on them, says, receive you the Holy Spirit. And then he says these amazing words, as the Father sent me, so send I you. I'm sending you the same way. In other words, I'm commissioning you to be my ambassadors. And this is what the message is, as my ambassadors in the world, you're going to be able to go in there and proclaim to people the way their sins can be forgiven. And if they don't want to receive it, they don't receive it. But your message, your mission, your ambassadorship is to tell people that they can be free from their sin. And I, I, I was sitting there this morning just thinking, man, what a ministry. And I feel like it's significant from this standpoint. I believe we're living in the last days and God wants to move in our lives in bringing the message that is so needed today. People are in a mess like the demoniacs. People are demon possessed. People are filled with themselves. People are hating God. People are hating one another. You know, this world is a mess. It's moving. It has, it not, it's not moving, it is. We are in the last days and we are going to see things unfold before our eyes that, that haven't been seen before. And we, how are we going to live in these days? What are you going to do? Are we going to get comfortable and sit back and, and maybe be fearful and, and just watch the things that are happening and, and, and being glad we're not, you know, unfortunate like some people or maybe the Christians that are being persecuted. You know, we can sit back and say, I'm glad that that's not happening to me. But is that really what God wants to do, us to be doing? We are living in a time that is like no other. We are in the last days and the Lord wants us to go out and to continue his ministry of bringing reconciliation to people and to let them know that their sins can be forgiven. Because like the paralytic, he, whether his a paralysis was through a sinful lifestyle, whatever, he was paralyzed and he couldn't move forward. And Jesus said, I'm giving you good cheer. He's giving this man, you know, good cheer. His sins are forgiven. And that man got up and he went home forgiven. And people are paralyzed all over this world from their sin. And they need to hear the message of redemption. They need to hear the message of Jesus Christ, that your sins are forgiven. And if they receive it, they receive it. If people don't receive it, they don't receive it. And so, but we have the power and the commission and we have the authority as his ambassadors to bring this message to a lost world. And he wants us to do it. And as I was sitting there this morning, just meditating on that, I thought this is the message really that ties into Matthew. This first miracle in chapter nine of, of Matthew with the paralytic people are paralyzed they're in their sin and they need the message of good cheer that their sins can be forgiven if god wants to heal them that's another thing but they need the message that their sins are forgiven so they can rise up walk and be of good cheer they can just take their bed go out the door and go home forgiven released from the burden of sin to have their sins and the weight of their sins unloosed and that's the ministry of Jesus, to, to loose the, the burden of sin, to set people free, to set to keep the captives free, to open the eyes of the blind. That's what Jesus does. That's his ministry. And may we go into the houses of those who are lame. May we be like the friends of the paralyzed man to bring them to Jesus because people need Jesus. And that's the message, really, I feel like the Lord got me up to share with you this morning that we are his ambassadors. We have the message of the forgiveness of sins. And God has commissioned us, filled us with his spirit, and told us to go into all the world. Are we going into all the world? That's the question. Are we bringing the message that Jesus has entrusted to us? He said to them, receive ye the Holy Spirit. We've been filled with the spirit. And he says, whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven and whoever sins are retained they are retained and that's the way it is some people believe and some people don't but we are res we're not responsible for their decision we're responsible to tell them we have a ministry as watchmen really 
That's the, that's the word that the Lord gave me in coming to England about being a watchman on the wall. The watchman wasn't responsible for the people's response to the message that judgment is coming upon the land. The watchman was to go tell the people of the city what he saw. And the people needed to then take to heart what was said. Some people would receive it and be you know, delivered. Other people wouldn't. And they would suffer the consequences. But the job of the watchman was to tell them. And that's our job as, as in our ministry as ambassadors for Christ, to tell people that Jesus forgives sin. He's come to set the captives free. So are we doing that? He's given us that amazing ministry, the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, so I was thinking about that. And when I, when I opened up my, my Bible to my reading for the morning, this is what I read. And I think it's, it was, I mean, the first thing I set my eyes on when I read uh, my reading for the morning was this. And I'm just going to read it to you. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals, and greet no, no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son... If peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Does that sound like whoever sends, you know, you forgive or forgiven, whoever sends you remit, the remittant? We bring the gospel to people and they can, you know, they can receive it and have their sins forgiven. We're, we're proclaiming that message to people. We're not doing it ourselves. Jesus has done it. We're now just proclaiming it. But you also have people that don't receive it. That sounds like exactly what's happening right now. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Verse 7 of chapter 10 of Luke. And remain in that same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whatever you, whatever city you enter, and they do not receive you, <clears throat> receive you, go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you, that it will be more tolerable in, day, in that day for Sodom, than for that city. Now that is it, an indictment that I would not spoken, want spoken against me. And then he goes, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But, I, but it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment then for you. Man, that is a heavy thing. That is a heavy woe that the Lord was saying to Chorazin, to Bethsaida. Bethsaida would have been passed by Jesus as he, as he had traveled the boat back to Capernaum. And Chorazin was right up the hill, but he's not done yet. He's going to say something against his very hometown of ministry. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me, or and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Man, if that doesn't tie into what the Lord put on my heart in John chapter twenty, verse twenty-three. Who, who's, whoever, you know, whoever 
You know, you say your sins are forgiven. They're forgiven. Who, who's ever sinned you remit to remit it. That's exactly what he's saying here. He who be, hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. It can't be more clear. He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Jesus has commissioned us. He has commanded us to go into all the world and to bring the message of salvation to the lost. If they receive it, they receive it. Praise the Lord. They get up like the paralytic. They're set free from their sins and they're, you know, they receive the gladness and the joy in their heart of the forgiven sins. If they don't want to receive it, they don't receive it. But Jesus says, man, just wipe the dust off your feet. And I feel like we're living in a time right now where we need to get the message out. We need to go as much as we can to wherever we can to bring the gospel of the kingdom of God because it's near people. And Jesus is coming again soon. And he wants us to tell people that they can have their sins forgiven. And many will receive it. Many will, you know, they'll receive that news, but many won't. And so that is an amazing thing. And I felt like the Lord wanted to to bring that word out to you because we're living in we're living in the last days and i've said that many times and the reason i've said that is because we are the signs of the times are upon us just look at the prophetic implications of what's happening in the world today prophecies just being unf you know unfolded right before our very eyes you see what's happening geopolitically globally economically we're in the last days. You know, the one world agenda is just being pressed upon us, whether you like it or not. And so these are the days that we need to be awake. We need to be watching. We need to be ready for the Lord's return. And like he says in the uh, first part of 10, he said to them as he sent them out, he said, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. The laborers are few and they are still few and maybe even fewer. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And so Jesus commissioned them and he's commissioning us. And I feel like he wants to remind us afresh of the ministry that the Father sent him to do. And he is sending us to go do it as well. To carry his good news, the gospel of the kingdom to this world right now. The labors are few, so we need to pray. And even right now, Lord, we just pray that you would send forth laborers. Raise them up, send them forth, Lord. Even in our church here in Calvary Chapel, York, we pray that you would raise up laborers, send them forth to wherever you're calling them to go. Lord, and maybe it's just staying here. But Lord, send forth laborers. Maybe it's our children, send them forth. Lord, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Lord, you have called us to go just like you went. You have commissioned us as ambassadors to bring this glorious news of your kingdom. And so we pray, Lord, that you would send forth laborers in Jesus' name. So that's the message from this morning. And as we go on to the next part of this message in Matthew, I think it's fitting as well. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to them, to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but, but sinners to repentance. And so again, I want to close with this part of of the story with Matthew because he sees Matthew as he passes by Matthew sitting in his tax booth now keep in mind this isn't a plush office posh off posh office this is the little tax booth probably on the edge of town remember tax collectors were hated 
they were viewed as traitors, you know, from Judaism. They've given traitors to the Romans. The Romans were hated by them. And so here the Romans are collecting tax for them. And so anyone that was a tax collector was despised by the Jews. Especially, guys, I mean, think about Matthew. He was a Levite. Matthew's job would have been to minister in the, in the temple. And here he is collecting taxes. And not only just collecting their taxes, but the tax guys, the tax collectors, would collect more than the tax often that was required. The government had set a tax, but the tax collectors would charge more and they would keep the leftover taxes. It was corrupt. These guys would bid for the better areas. So they would pay a lot of money just to have a jurisdiction over one area, a well-known, you know, maybe a, a, a high paying area. And so from the very beginning, it, you know, it was corrupt and they were hated. And so here's Matthew, Jesus calls Matthew. And I love the story here because you know, I can just picture the disciples going, Matthew, are you kidding, Lord? Not Matthew. You can't pick him. Do you know what that's going to do to you, the credibility of your ministry? If people see a tax collector there, they're not going to have anything to do with you. And yet Jesus calls Matthew. And Matthew leaves and follows him. And the other gospel accounts actually says that he left all and followed the Lord. Matthew, who's writing this account, doesn't even say that. Perhaps that's a mark of his humility. It just says he left and followed Christ. But in the other gospel accounts, he left all and followed him. And Matthew would have had a lot. And so he leaves and he follows Jesus. But get this. Now what happened is Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And then the Pharisees saw it and they were you know, outraged the fact that Jesus was sitting with such sinners. Well, you know, Matthew came to know the Lord and he, so what does he do? He gets set free. He experiences the joy of the Lord. He experiences the forgiveness of sin. He goes and gets all of his buddy tax collectors to come for a meal. Now, you know, he probably doesn't have many other friends but tax collectors. They all had to hang out together because nobody liked them. At least they had that in common. You know, misery loves company. So, you know, he, he invites his friends. Now, this is an important part of the story as well because they say that the majority of the people statistically, that come to the Lord, come to the Lord from those who are a year old or less in the Lord. In other words, the people that have only known the Lord for a year will bring more people to Christ than, the, than all the rest. Why? Because they're closest to the, their old life. And so here, Matthew, this is a great example of that. Matthew invites all of his tax collector friends. Perfect scene for Jesus to show up with his disciples, sitting with all these sinners. Of course, the Pharisees, you know, they couldn't believe it. They wouldn't have sat with the tax, co tax collectors for anything. You know, they were, they were too dignified for that. They were too religious, too righteous for that. But the Lord says, when he heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go learn what this meant, means. And he quoted Hosea and he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. To repentance and another account it says you know it talks about those who um, who think they're righteous but those that know they're sinners you know there are people that think they're righteous and this was a, this was the the case with these pharisees they thought they were righteous but he said i didn't come to call those who think they're righteous but those who know they're sinners and if you think about that the ones who think they're righteous but aren't can only think they're righteous. And the sad thing is they think they are. They think they're righteous, but they're not righteous. They're sin, full of sin. They can only think they're righteous. But those who know they're sinners can know they're sinners. And the ones who know they're sinners know they have a need for a Savior who can uh, make them righteous. Like Jesus did with this paralytic. Your sins are forgiven. That's what people need. That's what the world needs. And so Jesus has given us a message to go into all the Matthews of the world. Those who are the outcasts of the world. Who are the outcasts of the world today? You know, you name it. There are so many people that are marginalized, whether it's a homeless, whether it's somebody that's poor, whether it's somebody, you know, that maybe is in a lifestyle that they don't, they don't agree with. The world is filled with people that are, that are marginalized, that are outcasts. And it can be anyone. The wealthy can be 
outcast by by those who are poor, vice versa. The world is filled with people, filled with Matthews, filled with people who need to have their sins forgiven, who need to come to Christ, who need to experience the forgiveness of the Savior. And so this is really for us this morning as well, because Jesus is calling us as his, as his ambassadors to go into the world where the harvest is plentiful, it's ripe unto harvest, and it's filled with Matthews, it's filled with the outcasts. It's filled with people who need a savior, who's willing to sit down with them at dinner and to say to them, you know, praise the Lord, man, you've been forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And that's what people need. And so may we, as one brother put it, throw Matthew parties where we're inviting people to come to Christ, inviting people to come over and at least hear the gospel. Maybe they won't receive it, but like we read, well, that's, that's their problem. We have done our part. We've brought people to Christ and that's what we're supposed to do. And when we do that, that gives Jesus, you know, the opportunity to minister into their life and to bring the healing that they need, the forgiveness that they need of their sin. And so may we be ambassadors who are ambassadoring. <laughs> I not know how you say it. We need to be ambassadors that are doing our job, that are bringing the gospel to people, that are going into all the world, that is ripe in the harvest, and bringing the message of salvation. People need the Lord. And we have the answer. We have the message, the hope of eternal life. You and I carry it with us as his ambassadors. And so may we go into this world. May we do it. Oh, there goes my phone. May we do it. Bringing the message of salvation to the lost of this world. And so... You know, may the Lord, hang on a second, let me get this situated. There we go. May we be doing what he has called us to do. And so, <clears throat> so that's really the word this morning. I felt like the Lord wanted to encourage us as his people here to be doing it, to be going out into the world. This is our time. And so we need to be praying to the Lord of the harvest. We need to be there to bring the message of salvation to people. And so I just wanted to encourage you with those words. The world is filled with Matthews. The world is filled with the outcasts. The world needs Jesus. And he wants you to invite people over. He wants you to bring, bring them to Jesus. If you're, you know, he wants you as the friend of a paralytic, so to speak. He wants you to bring them to Jesus. And if it means tearing the tiles off of a roof, doing something that you're not accustomed to doing, maybe it's going to cost you. Like the Good Samaritan, it cost him. But... He couldn't leave that person half dead on the side of the road. He was half dead. That means that he could go either way. But the good Samaritan, the Levite, and the priest, they went across to the other side. But the good Samaritan couldn't leave that man in that state half dead. Our world is filled with people that are dead in their trespasses and sins. And they're, they're maybe alive in their bodies, but they're dead in their sins. So they're kind of half dead. They can go either way. We're bringing the gospel of the kingdom to them. So do what it takes to bring your friends, the lost people that you know, to Jesus. And they might hear the message, they might not. But our responsibility is to tell them the fields are right into harvest. And so um, that's the message this morning. Hear this beautiful this beautiful morning. And so may God bless you and may God strengthen you and may God speak to your heart the things that he wants you to hear as his ambassador. So Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for just your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you save sinners. And Lord, we are chief. You came and you rescued us. We were one sitting at the table like the Matthew, like the Matthews of this world rescued they, we heard your call come and follow me and we've come and followed you and so lord you have many you want to bring into your kingdom still and may we be going out as you, the father sent you, you you're sending us and may we bring the message of the forgiveness of sins the gospel of jesus christ thank you lord in jesus name amen so god bless you today and have a glorious uh, day and uh, God is good. God is really good. And he's good to people. He loves people. Show people Jesus. Bring him to Jesus. He'll do the rest. God bless you. Bye-bye.